was saying in the first service, I had just kind of a simple word, <clears throat> scripture that came to mind when I was just kind of considering the blessing of the Lord that we enjoy and I trust we never grow accustomed to. But the scripture is Proverbs 11, <clears throat> which says that by the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. There is a way in which God elevates a city, blesses a city, brings it into a place of freedom. I think of, I think it's back in Acts chapter 8, I believe, where Samaria, the believers in Samaria, God just did a wonderful thing in their midst. And it's interesting that the comment is that because of what God was doing in this people, there was great joy in this city. Would you love that to be said of Moncton? There's just great joy in the city, not because there's some new band passing through town or a new concert on the hill, but there's joy, there's a buzz in the city of Moncton because of what God is doing in his people. And that's what Proverbs says. It says, by the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by, its, by the mouth of the wicked that it is overthrown. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. And I wonder if we really appreciate the power in blessing, the power that is inherent in every single believer to be a blessing and to speak blessings. We know the scripture says in Proverbs 18, I believe it is, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life itself are contained within the power of the tongue. In other words, when we speak life, what happens? Life flows, right? I mean, we all know what it is to have someone speak life to us, to speak hope, to speak truth, and how that encourages us. But we also know what it is to have someone speak to us in a way that seems to just foster death. You know, maybe that somebody speaks or sometimes we're going to say something and we just sense the Holy Spirit checking us saying, don't say that. And it's not just because it's maybe a bad thing to say and it may not necessarily be untrue, but we know that it's just, we just feel gross after. When we speak out of anger, when we speak a word of judgment, when we speak, you know, just something critical, whatever, we may have gutted off our chest, but we just feel like we've just, blah, on somebody else, and we just kind of feel dirty. There's this withering effect to those kind of words, and yet there are words that we can speak that actually bring life, that bring hope, that bring blessing. Now, that is something that is true, of course, of everybody whether you know the Lord or not, but it is especially true, I believe, of those of us who know Jesus Christ, because if the Spirit of God lives within you, then you don't just speak as people. We are actually the oracles of God. We are Jesus in this world. We actually convey his hope, his light, his life. Whatever we speak, we have that opportunity to reverse the curse, you might say, in what might be around us. So, so words have power when they are released. And speaking blessing, I want us to understand this morning, is not just a sign of fanaticism. It's not just some trendy thing. Speaking blessing is actually a sign of spiritual maturity. It's understanding who we are. It's understanding who we carry. It's understanding what our assignment is as we move through our day. We, I was saying the first, uh, the first service there, but, but when somebody sneezes, what do we say? Right, God bless you, right, bless you. What are we saying? Hey man, I love it when you sneeze, keep it up. God bless you, that was an awesome sneeze. I mean, some people have a pretty cool sneeze, there's no doubt about it, and you might chuckle up. That's not what we're saying, right? What are we saying? We're saying, may the God of healing touch your sickness, your affliction, whatever it may be. May God make you whole. That's what we're actually saying to somebody. We're praying a blessing for that person. Now, what is a blessing? I think a blessing essentially is just bestowing or conveying goodwill. Uh, when God created mankind, when he created the earth, it's not a coincidence that after he created it, he blessed it. He said, be fruitful, be fulfilled, be at peace, prosper, multiply. But we know that sin came into the world and ruined what God intended. So now we as the people of God, what are we doing? Wherever we go, we are speaking again the blessing of God. We are speaking the intention of God. When we go into places, when we speak to people, and some other things I'll mention in just a moment, what are we doing? We're saying, Lord, restore in this situation what you've intended. Restore in this life. Lord, we see what the enemy has taken away, or the hopelessness, or the sickness, whatever it may be. Lord, we just speak blessing into this life. We speak life into this life. We speak, Lord, a releasing of your intentions for what you've had for this person. I believe that in these days that we are living, we see a lot of spiritual darkness, a lot of spiritual decay. But God is longing for a people who understand their role. God is longing for a people who actually, who actually exercise the privilege of blessing. 
In fact, the Bible says in Revelation 1, 6 that Jesus has cleansed us, forgiven our sin. He's done a wonderful work in our lives. And what has he made us into? He's made us into a kingdom of priests for himself, for God his Father, a kingdom of priests. What is a kingdom? A kingdom means simply that when believers live under the rulership of Jesus Christ, when with joy we consciously submit to Jesus Christ, we allow him to shape us by his word, by his spirit who speaks to us, that when we do that, we are actually establishing a kingdom where the reign of Jesus Christ is seen in us. There's something different about our lives. There's something different that characterizes us because as we submit to Christ, we're not just submitting to rules. In fact, we don't submit to rules. We submit to a love that won't let us go. And we gladly submit to that, and that love begins to shape us in ways that actually make others notice that the Lord is real. A kingdom of priests. What are priests? Priests are followers of Jesus Christ that we actually have a ministry, a priestly assignment to our culture. And what is that assignment? It is to actually speak blessing to other people. I don't think it's a coincidence that at the heart of the Reformation, in the church in the early 1500s, that at the heart of the Reformation was what doctrine? It was faith in Jesus Christ alone, but it was also the priesthood of every single believer. That the priesthood was not assigned to those who stand on the, on the, on the pulpit or, or on the platform, right? That, that's basically what Jesus hates. He talks about the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? It was a, a, a re-separating of the people. So you had clergy and laity, and the Lord said, I never intended that. You are all priests unto God. We have different ministries. We have different roles to play in the body of Christ as we serve one another and use the gifts he has given to us. But in our standing before Christ and our standing before the world, every single one of us eagerly are kings unto God. We are priests unto God. That is the role of every single one of us. No one can take your place. That's why the old British term vicar is actually unbiblical. Vicar is, is an abbreviation of vicarious, someone who takes your place. There's no such thing, and I don't mean this as a denominational bash at all, but just the terminology. There's no such thing as a vicar in the body of Christ. No one takes your place. No one substitutes for you. No one does your ministry for you. Every one of us are called to be priests before the Lord. We see that same doctrine being central to every revival in the church down through the ages, and it's not a coincidence in what God is doing again in his body around the world and in North America that we see. Once again, what is central to that is believers waking up to the fact that I'm a priest unto God. I have a ministry before the Lord, and as priests, we not only worship God, as wonderful as that is, and we enjoy that, but as priests, we are also called to bless people, to bless places. And you know, I think it's one ministry in the church that, that really seldom is exercised. The Bible says in Galatians 3 that if you belong to Christ, then you are what? Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now you wonder, how can we be Abraham's seed? Biologically, we're not his seed, but he lived so many years ago. He lived under an old covenant. We're in the new covenant. How are we Abraham's seed? Well, what Paul goes on to say that basically Abraham's seed physically, biologically, was Jesus Christ, prophesying that he would come who would be the savior of the world, and through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He also intended the nation to be blessed through the nation of Israel, but ultimately through the person of Jesus Christ. But the beautiful thing is, we see this principle carried over into the New Testament, is that it doesn't stop there. Now that Jesus lives within you and me, not only is there a biological seed that has blessed the peoples of the earth, but now there is a spiritual seed that is in you and me that we verbally speak, that we bestow upon others. Lives can be touched, situations, environments can be changed because of the spiritual seed of Jesus Christ that we carry within us. We have a sample, for example, of one of the priest's prayers that you might pray, number six. We've heard it many, many times. Read it with me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? Isn't that a beautiful blessing? I mean, that's not just empty words. That's not just a, a nice thing somebody wrote up. You get this sense of weight. Even as you speak those words, you get a sense that it carries something. It makes a difference, this, this blessing that has been spoken. The Lord, the Lord bless you. Isn't that powerful? 
You walk into a situation where there's hopelessness. You, you speak to somebody, and, and then they just feel overwhelmed. They feel shut down. And, and you just walk in and say, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord would turn toward you and give you peace. What are you saying? That's the heart of God toward you. That's the message I've come to bring to you. There's power in the blessing from the people of God. Now, the Bible is clear that there is a direct correlation between what we allow God to do in our heart and the actual impact we can have around us. As we allow the Lord to work on us, to grow us, then we can have an impact on the culture around us. And we do that through the words that we speak, and we also do that through the blessing of God that is upon our life, the blessing that we carry wherever we go. Now, I don't mean just kind of empty words. What I mean by the words that we speak is that our words convey attitude. Our words convey where our heart is. And when we know who we are with Christ, when we are walking with the Lord, when we are speaking like Jesus said in response to what he hears the Father speaking, what the Spirit is speaking to us, then there is power in the words that we speak. There's power in words that we release, that flow from the people of God. There's also a blessing of God upon our life that changes things around us. There's lots of examples in the Bible. For example, we know in Egypt, Egypt went through this sovereign time of God's protection, God's provision. Why? solely because of a man named Joseph who was blessed by God and in a position of influence. Egypt was saved, starvation and maybe annihilation because of the presence of a man who had the blessing of God upon his life. You know the story of Jacob. Jacob went to work with his uh, uncle Laban and he wanted, to, he wanted to marry one of his daughters. And so he said, well, I'll work X amount of years. And Laban said, okay. He came to collect the daughter and he got fooled. He had to work another seven years for, for, for the other daughter, the daughter he really wanted. And you think, well, Laban's such a trickster. Well, he wasn't just getting free labor because Laban actually said himself, he said, he said, he said that Jacob, he said, God has blessed me because of you. And I don't want you to go. You know, if I had six daughters, I'd keep tricking you because, you know, I'm enjoying prosperity. There's just something of God over our home, over this, over this region because of you. God has blessed me because of you. Friends, some of you, if not many of you, are in workplaces that are blessed because you're there. They are different because you are there. It's not, not just different because you have a different work ethic, as we all ought to. There's prosperity in that as well. But there's also a blessing upon your life. And when you go there, people know there's something different about you. Now, not everybody may talk to you. There may be even some talk behind your back. I don't know. But I guarantee you, when life starts going sideways, who are they looking for? They're looking for that person. They may not understand their religion. They may not understand this Christianity stuff. They might even get uncomfortable if you talk about it. But they will seek you out because they recognize there's something upon your life. There's something that marks you out. There's something different about you. And so God blesses your workplace, not just through the work that you do and blessing your work, whatever kind of work you may do, but he also blesses that place by you being there. You can't see it in the, in the realm of the Spirit, but the reality is you literally are a light in a dark place. I remember a, a New Age guru when I was at Creation Festival, I think it was back in the, I don't know when it was, 80s, I think, we drove down to Pennsylvania, shared his testimony. I thought it was kind of interesting. He said, he said, I mean, I experienced real things in the demon world. You know, light shining from my fingers and astral projection, all that kind of stuff. He said, my parents were witches and warlocks, and I was born into it. And he said, when I came to Christ, it was all gone. But he said, when I was baptized in water at the church, I could actually, as a stand in the tank, and I looked over this congregation of a couple thousand people, I knew who were Christians and who weren't, because there was a literal light over each one of them. There was a light, a light. He said, I knew exactly who they were. Now, we don't see that sometimes, but I promise you, or we may grow accustomed to it, but I promise you, those who don't know the Lord, they see that light. Now, some folks don't like light, you know, because you like to stay asleep. The light goes on, you want to turn over, pull the covers up, whatever, you may have a different reaction, but people know there's something about you, that you carry something. And what you carry, of course, is the blessing of the Lord that's upon your life. Now, there's a mantra in our workforce today, by and large, that says, minimal effort for maximum pay. A lot of folks work by that. But I believe God is looking for a people who are more concerned about being a blessing 
than they are just about being blessed. Less concerned about just the paycheck, the work environment, how things are going, if I enjoy my job or not, but more concerned about, Lord, make me a blessing wherever I go. Make me a blessing in my community. Make me a blessing in my workplace. So the question is, how do we become a blessing in our city? By the blessing of the upright. It is through, via the blessing of the upright that a city is actually exalted. I'll give you two simple ways. One is we need to accept our privileged role. What I mean by that is we need, there needs to be something within us that turns on and we realize, man, I'm not just an ordinary person who actually has a different religion than somebody else. I'm a priest of God. I carry the presence of God. My words matter. My prayers matter. My assignment matters wherever I may be. I need to accept my role. The idea of speaking blessings seems strange to so many people in our Western culture, but friends, I want to encourage us. It is a ministry that every single one of us can operate in if we choose to do so. In fact, I would say that one indication that you actually believe in the power of God and the power of God is relevant and applicable to our day is the fact that you actually function in that role, that we actually do something with what it is the Lord has given to us. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Would it be too bold to say, we don't need any more blessings? We don't need more blessings. We don't need to pray for more blessings. What do we need to do? We need to start conveying the blessings we have. We need to start speaking those, ministering those blessings. Allow the Lord to pour back into us as we pour out. Freely receive, we freely give. As the old saying goes, we are blessed, why? To be a blessing. In whatever way that may be that the Lord blesses us and cares for us, that we know his peace, we know his prosperity, we know his purposes, why? In order to minister those to others. Satan doesn't want us to know about that. He doesn't want us to understand the power of blessing because it's a threat to his plans. But the Lord has given us an assignment to pass those blessings along. I said it in the first service. I don't know if this is true or not. It's not the first time I lied. I'm just kidding. I'm not. But what I mean by this is, I don't know, the thought crossed my mind as I was preparing for this morning. The thought just crossed my mind. I wonder if in some small, simple, insignificant way, that one of the reasons why we enjoy the blessing of the Lord, and the Lord has so much more, and we have so much more to learn and grow in, but it may be one of the very small reasons why we enjoy the blessing of the Lord as Glad Tidings Church is because of what has been a personal practice of mine for almost 18 years. And what that is, is when I'm alone in my car driving through town, whenever I pass by another church, I verbally, vocally pronounce blessing on that church. I say, God, bless that church. Bless that leadership. Bless those people. Lord, grow them, free them, meet with them, love on them, Lord. That's always been my prayer. And I don't know if some small way the Lord's just kind of honored that and say, I'll do that and I'll bless you too. In fact, I gotta be honest with you this morning because I don't wanna sound too spiritual, but it wasn't really birth or, the, birth or the best of circumstances. I remember when I first came and we were fewer in number at that time, still a good-sized congregation, but we've, we've seen a lot of growth. But I can remember being parked at the lights, uh, the red light on, on St. George Street, St. George Boulevard, uh, just on the top there. And, and I'm just kind of sitting there, and, and, and for some strange reason, I just kind of felt this little, almost like a little burn in the side of my face. I'm just looking straight ahead. And I look over, and it's Moncton Wesleyan Church. And in those days, it was a big church. It still is today, but it was a lot bigger than our church. Now, Pastor Buckingham and I are good friends, okay? So it's, it's all good now. But it was at that moment that I recognized something in me I didn't like. This jealousy, maybe even resentment, or a spirit of competition. And I knew immediately the Lord was saying, the only way you're going to uproot that is every time you pass by, you bless them. Bless them. Pray for them. Pray for prosperity. Pray for greater growth. Pray for the leadership. And that's been our heart ever since, and that's grown to every church that we go by over and over again, just praying the blessing of the Lord. And I believe the blessing of the Lord not only works in that sense that we release that blessing, we release that life to the person or situation that we speak to, but there comes something in return for us. We're getting our eyes off of ourselves. We're being reminded of what our mission is, what our assignment is, and when the Lord can find faithful people who understand that assignment and move in that assignment, then as we bless, we are blessed. 
in so many ways that we may not even recognize. We need to accept that privileged role that we have, and we need to advance in that role. What I mean by that is God said to Joshua in chapter 1, he said, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Now, that was a promise to Joshua, but I promise you it still applies today. And the reason I believe that is because this same sentiment is actually echoed in the words of Jesus in Matthew 28. Will you read it with me? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Okay, let's stop there for a second. All authority, Jesus says, it's been given to me. I have won it through the cross. It is finished. All authority is now mine. Now he speaks to you and me. Let's read the rest. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Oh, sorry, always. Yes, he is. But you see the same message here. What does he say? Therefore, go. All authority is mine. I have made you priests and kings unto God my Father. My spirit lives in you. Don't wait for me to open a door. I've blown the doors wide open. There's no doors anymore, right? The gates of hell will not stand against you when you advance. Don't pray for a door to open. All authority is now yours. Now go, go. What's he saying? Advance. Everywhere you step, everywhere you go, you've got to understand what you carry. Everywhere you go, you've got to understand that you bring light and life. Everywhere you go, you've got to understand that you have the opportunity to speak blessing to speak words, maybe when nobody's around, and some of you have done that already, and you still do that. I know you go to your workplace, and during lunch hour, maybe sometimes you're just praying for the workplace, or some of you have mentioned before, you go to work a little bit early, and you take some time to be in the Word, or take some time just to pray over the office, and the poor souls don't realize it when they come to work, somebody prayed over their seat that morning. They've got no, they've got no chance. The seat of God's already on. They, you know, God's gonna do a work in their heart because you're there, but it's because you understand your assignment as a child of God. God wants to spread his blessings through our city. But here's the key. We are his blessing. We are his blessing. Tell the person beside you, you are God's blessing. As I said in the first service, you may have had a fight before you came to church, so that may be hard to do, but just look him in the eyes. You are God's blessing. We are a blessing to this city. God blesses our city and our culture through us. There's an interesting verse in Ezekiel 22. Israel had turned to idolatry, and God said this to the prophet. He said, I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. Do we realize there is literally a wall of righteousness? Don't know what shape it's in but it's around our land, around our city. He said, I search for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so I would not have to destroy the land. And what did he do? He sends the prophet Ezekiel through the city, the width and the breadth of it, down the alleys, through the streets, in search of what? One, just one righteous person so he would not have to destroy the entire city. And friends, that's where you and I become a blessing to our city. First of all, and second, he says, that the blessing of God flows through us to those who don't know, as we sang earlier, the goodness of God. They know nothing of God's goodness. But the blessing of God flows toward them if we understand that the Lord blesses us, not, as James says, to just consume it upon our own lusts, but that the God, God blesses us to be a blessing to our city. In whatever way it may be, his presence financially, freedom, a life that's working, whatever it may be. He wants it to flow to others around us. Let me just give you in closing a couple practical ways that we can bless our city. The first one I would suggest, very simple, is begin with your own neighborhood. Just begin with your own neighborhood. Begin with your own workplace. Don't bother raising your hands, but how many know the names of your neighbor? How many know anything about their lives? Anything that you could pray about? Anything that would concern you? Anything you would take to God in prayer about? We should at the very least know the person to our left and to the right and the three houses in front of us and maybe one in back if there's no fence. We should at least know them. We should at least be having conversations. Now, I don't know the person to my right because we live on the corner lot. Actually, there's another house, so I haven't got to know them yet. They've been moving a few times. Not because of us. They've just been moving. 
a few times. I just noticed the price of houses has gone down a lot since we've been there. But, but we can begin just there. And you know what else we can do? How many like going for a walk around the neighborhood, right? Have you ever considered when you go for a walk to pray for the homes along the way? Just to maybe ask God for a burden, just pray a general, generic kind of blessing as you walk, or, or just allow the Lord to maybe lay something in your heart. Somebody was sharing a little while ago how they began to do that, and God began to really burden them for particular houses. Then over time, he began to lay things in their heart. I want you to take this to this house. I want you to take that to that house. And they began to do that. It's amazing what, what God has begun to open up. But we need to pray as we walk around our neighborhood or as we get to know the people, get to know more about them and take them to prayer and see God begin to open up lost in their lives and, and the ministry opportunities will obviously be there. I remember a couple who were actually going for a walk and as they were walking along, all of a sudden they just heard from one house just this screeching. This couple, husband and wife, man and woman, I don't know what, they're just screeching, having this argument. Now typically what a lot of folks do is you hear that, what do we do? Right? What I love about this couple is they're walking along, they hear the screeching, they stop, reach out their hands to the house. In the name of Jesus, we just declare peace right now. We, we, we invite your kingdom, Lord. We invite your love right now. And it just immediately begins to subside. Now, I don't know if they saw these crazy folks out the front you know, sidewalk doing that. Maybe it just spooked them. There was no indication that they saw them. But there's just something of a spiritual dynamic that happened there. Why? Because number one, this couple, ordinary believers, understood their priestly role. They understood who they were. And what did they do? When that happened, they moved right into it. That's our role. That's our privilege. This is our opportunity. They moved right into that because they understood who they were, and they understood the authority that they have over the powers of darkness. They understood that by their blessing. That righteousness, the city is exalted. The neighbors are exalted. The climate can change because of their walk with the Lord. And friends, blessings are not silent prayers. Blessings are public declarations. It's walking through your workplace when no one's around. I suggest when no one's around. And speaking out loud. Speaking names, declaring things. You can do it while they're there. <laughs> That'd be interesting. <laughs> Whatever, I'm getting off topic, but it's just that intentionality. It's just understanding the role that you have. Even if you're in a workplace where nobody seems to talk much or maybe nobody even likes you, not for any particular reason, they just, you know, whatever's not a very close office environment. Friends, that can begin to change, and they don't understand why. Because overseas and over a long period of time, it could be 10 years, but you're just faithfully, Lord, I speak blessing in this place. I speak prosperity. I speak, Lord, as I come by this, this cubicle here, Lord, I just lay my hands on, on this chair. You know who sits here. You know what they're going through. Father, I, I pray for a miracle. What, whatever it is that the Lord is leading you to do. But that's the beautiful privilege that we have. But those are public proclamations. So as I said in the first service, I want to encourage you to take a hike. Just take a hike, and while you do, pray. Make it useful. Number two, real quickly, I want to encourage you to pray for more courage to talk about Jesus. Pray for courage to talk about Jesus more to your friends, to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to strangers, whoever it may be. I was so encouraged Thursday night. As you know, we, we uh, do some street ministry, and, and we, we encountered a number of different people. And I, and I just marveled at how often when we first would meet with people, there'd be either indifference or there'd be anxiousness or animosity or, or, or just you know, resentment kind of thing. But you could just sense as God was just speaking blessings. He was just speaking life and love and, and comfort, just how the walls begin to come down and, and ministry happens. And, and you just see peace begin to settle in heart, you begin to see hope, and, and in some cases as well physically, you see the Lord touch and heal bodies. It's just, it's just the nature of God. He wants to bless, he wants to love, he wants to restore people to his original intention. And that leads me to the final idea, simply, if we want to know ways that we can bless our city, it's just, maybe just try joining in some evangelism opportunity. Or, or, or initiative. We talked about Love on Moncton. There's Gather to Go. There's Alpha. There's other ministries. We just have an opportunity. If you just kind of need to shake things up a little bit and get exposed a little bit, build some courage, then just involve yourself in some of these things, even for a short period of time, just to get a taste and just to see what God can do through you. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8, will you say it with me? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he also who, he, sorry, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies 
because of his spirit who lives in you. I know we say this, but friends, there is a life force in you, if you know Jesus Christ, that can overthrow any power of darkness, any realm of darkness, any hopelessness, any impossible situation, any stronghold in your workplace. But do we really believe that? But you see, when that life flows is when we as the people of God understand our office and we understand our assignment to speak and to be a blessing wherever we go. I'm gonna ask the worship team to join me. As we close this morning, you may be like Abraham. You know, Abraham was promised by God, you're gonna have a son. And Abraham's first response, like you and me, was, well, nice idea, but I'm 100 years old. My wife is 90. It's not going to happen. And yet God worked a miracle in his body and his wife's body, and they produced new life. And you may be here this morning, and maybe you're in a season where you just feel like, I don't really believe anything of spiritual significance is only ever going to happen through me. I just kind of feel like I'm done. And it doesn't mean that you're old physically. You may have been a Christian for many, many years, but maybe you've been in a season where you just feel like, man, it's just been dry. I don't know the last time I've produced anything of life in my walk with Christ. I don't know the last time I've experienced anything of his touch or blessing or anything by way of nature. We sang the song, you know, a promise keeper, miracle worker. That, you know, that's who my God is. I sing about that, but Lord, I've not experienced that in my life for a long time, if at all. We just kind of feel like, Lord, I don't expect anything really of any significance to flow through my life to somebody else, let alone make a difference of where I am. But Paul says that the Holy Spirit in you can still share his life through you by the blessings that you speak and by a recognition that you carry the blessing of God upon your life wherever you go. And he says, now I just want you to step out. I blessed you, and I want you to be a blessing. E even as recent as this morning, if you've enjoyed my presence, if you've enjoyed the blessing of the presence of the Holy Spirit, in your mind's eye, why don't you just kind of gather some of that up and say, Lord, I just can't keep this for myself. I don't want to just leave it on the chairs and on the floor and let it go to waste. Lord, I want to gather up what I've experienced in your blessing and your presence today. I want to take it with me when I go home. I want to take it to my neighbor. I want to take it into the workplace. Or this morning, God might even just give you some fresh assignments my, my prayer is that God would even just open our eyes wherever we may be, wherever we, wherever we are where we feel we're on the defense. You may be in a university situation and, and just feel like, man, the whole system's against us. They just hate Christians. Everything is just a different narrative. Or, or, or maybe, again, in your workplace, you hear people sometimes the way they talk or the jokes they make or just how they just seem to be so aloof or so indifferent to spiritual things. And, friends, we can be on the defense but we've got to remember that this life force that is within us, greater is he that is in you than anyone who comes against you. And it may take time. It'll take a season. The Lord has battles to fight in the heavenlies. There's things that he brings into place, but he's just looking for his people who understand who they are and say, okay, Lord, I'm outnumbered. That makes it more fun. That makes it more of a challenge. I don't know about you. I went to three years of Bible college. Back in those days, that's all we had was three years. And I just got so tired after a while. I enjoyed the fellowship. This is going to sound really, uh, I didn't know if I should say it. All in favor? <laughs> I mean, it's nothing profound. But I can remember after three years of college, I had to work before I went into ministry for, for about a year, secular job. And, and I heard someone use a bad word. And it was actually refreshing. I, I, I can remember it. I just felt like, oh, I'm somewhere I can be of use. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know the exact word, but you know what I'm saying? Like there's something about knowing what you possess, who you are, and the, and the glorious message you have to share and what you carry with you, and then finding yourself in the darkness. And then rather than being overwhelmed or hiding or being a protective, saying, oh, God, you're greater. You're greater. I don't know how long it's going to take. Don't know how you're going to do it, but let's get started. I'm going to speak blessing. I'm going to get to know people. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to intercede for them. I'm going to go when nobody's around and be, and be laying hands on things and declaring the blessing of God. And I'm just anxious to see how you're going to do it, Lord. 
And I promise you, bit by bit, you start seeing the shift and the change and the conversations and the hunger and the need and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and salvations and situations changing. We begin to see those things because we understand that we are a kingdom of priests unto God. Amen. And we carry the blessing of the Lord with us.